Hello and welcome to JHEP's lesson on exothermic reactions. This is going to be a long video, so look at the description if you want to skip some sections. So the first thing we've got to know is actually what an exothermic reaction is. Well, exothermic means an overall exit of energy. We are losing energy. So say, for example, we've got this happy little lad here. His name is called James. And there's lots of reactions going inside him. He's very happy. He's very energetic. A lot of reactions happen inside him. So we dunk him into this beaker, which is at 5 degrees Celsius. Now, because he's having all these reactions happening inside his system, he is getting hot. He is giving off that energy. He is giving off that energy in form of heat. And afterwards, leaving it for, I don't know, two minutes, the temperature of the whole beaker, the water, rises to 50 degrees Celsius. Now the thing is, this lad over here has lost that energy. It has been given off into its surroundings. That means for, Joe, for James over here, his overall energy is going to be negative. And we can actually um, put that as a diagram, but we're not going to come, we're going to come back to that later. So the most important reaction, which is exothermic, which you would ever need in your life, is respiration, where we have a sugar, say c 6 h 12 O6 and we react it with oxygen. Okay, so this this is a uh, this is a combustion process, by the way, and it goes on to make six CO2 plus six H2O. Now the thing is, you can either remember this or you could calculate it. Um, if you want to know how to calculate it, please look at my other video, which is reactions of alkanes. So. This reaction is overall exothermic because obviously why would we use this reaction if we don't give off energy? So we end up with carbon dioxide, water plus energy. And because of that, the overall reaction is a negative sign. That means it would be minus 2801 kilojoules per mole. Obviously, I can't fit them all in. Okay, and this sign over here tells us that it is an exothermic reaction. If it was endothermic, then it would be a plus. Because remember, it the system is giving off that energy. So, if you remember, if you are a fan of my videos, you might remember this slide. And this is an overall combustion of fuels. This is the most, this is a very popular exothermic reaction it has actually got its own standard um, enthalpy change of combustion which we'll come back to that later because it's so common what we do we oxidize um, uh, hex hexane in this case and we end up with carbon dioxide water plus energy okay the whole reason why we're burning these fuels in excess oxygen is to give off energy and that's exactly what happens in our boilers and in our cars and so on and so forth the same with alcohols they um they react with uh oxygen to make carbon dioxide and water now the overall the overall energy for that will be negative something, let's say negative 1,234 kilojoules per mole. Luckily for you, they would probably tell you what it is, but sometimes you do have to work it out. And again, that is in um, later on in the video. Let's say, for example, this one as well is negative 532 kilojoules per mole. These are obviously unrealistic values, but the most important thing is the, is the negative sign, which tells us it is an exothermic reaction. Now, the thing is, we would mostly like to do it under standard conditions. That means we, can be we are able to compare one reaction with the next. And the standard conditions are 100 kilopascals, or one atmosphere, 298 Kelvin, or 25 degrees Celsius, and one mole per decimeter cubed of concentration. In the exam, it would ask you what standard conditions are. There would be one mark. Please state one of the, um, all three of them. The easiest, easiest one to remember is the one atmosphere, 
25 degrees Celsius and one mole per decimeter cubed. If you remember the first section, that's fine by me to be honest. Okay, so the standard, as I said before, this, um, it's got its own standard enthalpy change combustion. And that is the energy change when one mole of a substance reacts completely with an excess amount of oxygen, making this the limiting reagent, um, under standard conditions, in their standard states. And that's important because, again, we want it, we want to be able to compare one reaction with the other. So it's got to be in standard conditions under standard states. Now, how do we represent this in a diagram? So let's say we have got um, the first reaction, which is to make this, uh, which I've just copied from one slide to the other. Now, the thing is, we have got C6H14 plus 9 over 2 of oxygen, which is 9.5. I should just write that. So that's going to be in, let's say, a zero energy state and this is the reagent side okay we put this on a profile diagram which shows us the progress of this reaction and the energy change on the y-axis so we have the reagents here um, all the time so that would be C6H14 plus 9.502 Let's say that this is at a zero energy state. Now, pretend that we have got C6H14 and 9.502 in the classroom. And they start, um, you blindfold them, and they start running around, just running around at different speeds and different intensities. Now, the thing is, if one person bumps into the other, but with not a lot of force, the re reaction is not actually going to start. A fight is not going to start, but if one person runs and charges into the other person, knocking them over with enough energy, it's going to start a reaction. It's going to start a fight. Okay, so let's just say that um, what's it? Oxygen and C6H14 have collided with enough force. So in that system, we have got a lot of energy. We've got a rays of energy okay because energy has be energy is in that system or is in that body okay and then before you know it when they do form again it's going to lose that energy and the thing with, with exothermic reactions is that the energy is actually less than it was before it's given off all this energy that means we're going all the way past the zero energy state and into the negative okay where it has got a lot of energy and we end up with the products which is 6 co2 plus 7 h 2 o okay what i try to do is a bit of kinetics as well as that so how do we know what energy we need to use to make them have a reaction because it can't be flimsy energy it's got to be a minimal of some sort of number okay and this is called the activation energy ea okay and this is the energy that is required to start a reaction so let's say activation energy is at um i don't know uh 1000 kilojoules all right to, they have to both collide at each other at a minimum of 1000 kilojoules for us to start this reaction and when that happens we have got an overall oops wrong color we've got an overall change in energy which we depict with delta h and as you can see the progress what has happened is that there's an increase of energy in the system and then there's a big drop in the energy in the system to make 6CO2 plus 7H2O. And now the thing is, when you're drawing the arrows to depict the activation energy, where we start from the products and we enter the top ridge of the curve, 
Make sure it's not a double headed arrow, please. As well as Delta H. Please do not do a double headed arrow. Please, please, please. If there's anything that you remember from this video, don't do double headed arrows. Okay. This is Delta H, the change in energy, as we've seen. So, how do we actually measure the enthalpy change of a reaction? Well, if we've got a fuel, what we can do, we can weigh that fuel, um, first of all, and then burn it in air. And we can have a beaker of water on the clamp or on a Bunsen burner stand. I can't remember what you call it. And we know what the, um, we know how much water is in here. And we can measure the temperature change from the beginning which will probably be 21 degrees Celsius, that's room temperature, to the end. And let's say the end is 78 degrees Celsius. So we can find out the change in temperature, which is delta T, which is 78 minus 21, which is 57 degrees Celsius. And then afterwards, we can find out the mass that has been reacted by just weighing it up again. So let's say, for example, at the start, we started off with one grams of um, methanol I don't know there you go and then at the end of it we ended up with 0 0.2 grams we know that the change in mass or the mass that has reacted which is which we depict with M is 0 0.8 grams now remember this because this is going to come in uh, use in the next bit so now the thing is with the exam is that sometimes they may ask you to find out what the overall change in energy is like this over here and what we've got to do we have got to plan an experiment and calculate it using these steps so we have got an excess of magnesium and that reacted with 100 centimeters cubed of 2 moles per decimeter cubed of copper sulfate. So this is copper sulfate. And our little man here is the magnesium in excess. Okay. Now the thing is, we need a limiting reagent all the time. So just so that we know that we won't end up with an X, you know, it won't happen all the time. It won't just continuously go and not stop. So we need an limiting reagent and this is our limiting reagent so if you want to know what limiting reagent is in more detail please look at reactions of alkanes i think it's there i'm not entirely sure it is anyways so we know that this has reacted with that in this equation which is over here now the magic equation that we need to find out how much energy has been lost in this reaction is in this box which is mass times specific heat capacity times the change in temperature now here we go i've already written that here q equals energy change or yeah energy change because remember when they react they are going to give off energy how do i know that it's because before it, they reacted it was 20 degrees and after they reacted it was 60 degrees so that means there's been an x an exit of overall energy and that means an, it's an exothermic reaction so we need to find out what the, what energy we've lost in the system but first of all we need to see the mass where is the mass well the mass is over here even though it's in centimeters cubed that is still the mass because well it doesn't even tell you the mass here we've got the mass here and that would be 100 grams because one centimeter cubed is the same as one gram so we've got the mass here the specific heat capacity will always be given to you mostly unless they try to mess things up and the specific heat capacity of a solution is 4.18 joules per gram per Kelvin okay they will always give it to you if they ask you you can say 4.2 because that, is, that would be rounded up the 
temperature change is 60 minus 20, which is 40 degrees Celsius. Now we've got our information to find out how much energy we've lost. So, um, here's the definition as well of that. So, we've got to do 100 times 4.18 times 40. And on my calculator, that would make... So, here's the answer in joules. So, now, this is the energy that has been given off in the system to its surroundings. Okay, so what about the system itself? Obviously, it has lost that energy. So that means it's in depth of 1,600, oops, 16,720 joules. Okay, and that's, a, that's the most important thing, that you change the sign, because this is what is in the system right now. Okay. Now, the next bit, we need to find out what's the amount of copper sulfate that's reacted. Because right now, we have got the mass, or the concentration, should I say, sorry, and we've got the volume. The concentration is, drum roll please, where is it, 2 moles per decimeter cubed. The volume is 100 centimeter cubed. Now the thing that I always do, I will always convert, convert it to decimeter cubed, always. And to convert that to decimeter cubed, you divide it by a thousand, divide it by 1000 equals 0 0.1 decimeter cubed it makes life so much easier and if you remember it's n equals c times v which is 100 0 0.1 times 2 which makes 0 0.2 moles of cuso4 that reacted okay that means for because looking at this equation that means 0 0.2 moles of copper sulfate reacted with 0 0.2 moles of magnesium okay because the molar quantities or the ratio of it is one to one right if it was two to one that means we had 0 0.4 moles that reacted with 0 0.2 moles of that but seeing that it's not it's 0 0.2 0 0.2 now the next thing that we have to do is to scale this up to one mole Okay, so now let's write this down um, strategically. So, for 0 0.2 moles of copper sulfate that reacted, we got minus, let's see what we got. Uh, we got minus 16720, minus 16720 joules of energy that we've lost. So that means for one whole mole, which we multiplied by 5, and whatever we do to one side, we must do to the other. That means we have lost a total of 16720 times 5 minus 83600. 83600 joules of energy that we have lost and mainly the reason why we do it in one mole is so that we can compare this to another reaction it's very good to have a standard to it okay so we have lost 830 83600 joules or 83.6 kilojoules of energy and the last thing you've got to do is just to write that here delta h equals minus i forgot it again minus 83.6 kilojoules remember the sign the units is so important okay and that is it for the session 
This is a bit different from the book because this is 60 degrees instead of 65 degrees, just so that you don't comment saying that the answer in the book is different. And that is it.